Welcome to part six of Early Americans and Oceania. Now we're going to look at the Pacific Rim peoples. When we expand our view of uh, the first Americans and those around the Pacific Rim, the one thing that we'll find, especially when we look around the Pacific Rim, is we're going to have a lot of different cultures that are never going to ad ad adopt that uh, agrarian lifestyle, right, of creating sedentary villages and and uh, extensive agriculture, right? You're going to have a lot of groups that are going to maintain and hold on to that hunter-gathering uh uh, aspect of life. And we're going to see this in this region in, in uh, Pacifica, if you will, uh, these nomadic people, uh, they're going to be everywhere, whether we're looking in the Arctic or in the deserts of Australia or anywhere along the island chains of, of the Pacific Ocean, right? Now, the one thing we will see when we take a look at these hunter-gathering groups here is that they are going to share certain uh, social, economic, and dietary similarities, right? And so we're going to take a look at these people uh, uh, in these different cultures from the Inuits up in uh, the extreme North America to the Australian Aborigines and look at some of the artifacts and their ancient ancestors. So up to this point, when we've taken a look at a lot of these ancient civilizations, we've talked about them adopting an agrarian lifestyle and forming these sedentary villages. But these groups that we're looking here at here are going to maintain this hunter-gathering lifestyle long after most other people had abandoned it, right? Um, now, hunter-gathering cultures are going to share a, a series of certain universal characteristics that we can draw upon, especially when we take a look at these ones here in the Pacific Rim, right? Uh, First of all, they derive their caloric intake from non-domesticated plants and non-domesticated animals. And so in other words, so they are uh, gathering things like nuts and berries. They are fishing. Uh, they hunt uh, plants. They eat insects. They uh, usually small wild game is, uh, is a source of meat. Scavenged carcasses, of course, will play a part, part as well. And, you know, all, like I said, all food stocks and stuff tend to be wild plants. Um, Hunter gatherings are almost always nomadic, right? Following their food sources, uh, which is really a double edged sword. On the one hand, it gives them a great deal of flexibility because of their mobility, but it also limits their material possessions, right? Um, hunter gatherings typically live in very small bands, typically uh, numbering from 10 to 40 individuals, often related. So it creates a very, uh, uh, very rigid uh, structure. Right, the societies are more egalitarian than farming or pastoral communities. Uh, there's typically no pronounced classes or hier hierarchical structures to them. Uh, they tend to be more gender uh, neutral. There's be, tend to be more gender equality there. Uh, and this is probably the result of the fact that everyone has to contribute to uh, the general good of the group, right, through activities, including hunting. Um, many hunting gathering bands are also matrilineal, meaning the women are, uh, or that, that the women's bloodline traces the ancestry, right? The ancestry is traced through the mother, not through the paternal uh, bloodline, through the father. Uh, this is often brought about by the uh, effort to avoid inbreeding these, in these small groups, right? The male member would often leave and join other bands to find a mate. Okay. Um, now, these exchanges would sometimes facilitate these hunter-gathering societies to gather during certain times of the year into larger groups to do large, more communal hunting and more large communal uh, activities. Now, some of these groups will just keep on with that uh, nomadic hunter-gathering lifestyle just based on their environment. You know, it's a way to survive, like up in the north with the Inuit and the Eskimos, right? As other societies are uh, moving towards agrarian lifestyles, the regions in which they leave, live in are just not conducive to extensive farming. It's ill-suited for it. And so they continue to develop uh, a, an amazing way, uh, array of strategies and technologies to adapt and survive in their extreme environment. Hunting and gathering, of course, being a central part of it. Uh, to give you an example on the opposite side of the, glo the globe, the in Scandinavia, the forerunners of today, Sami, were the Finni people who uh, inhabited the areas there in northern Scandinavia around 2000 BCE and developed very similar lifestyles to that of the Inuit and Eskimo. 
we have some written uh, 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 examples of them that we can at least use as parallels. Uh, the Roman author Tacitus, uh, Tacitus actually wrote of the Finni people. Uh, and one of the things he described was the, the fact that they do not engage in farming, right? Uh, today, the, the, the Sami uh, herd reindeer, that's a practice that's only about five or 600 years old, but you know, uh, but the, the life ways that we see uh, described by Tacitus are very, uh, in, the, in the Finney are very similar to what we see with the Inuit and the Eskimos right down to the groups that live up there still to this day. Now, on the opposite side of that is that you have cultures that have uh, th that have developed and thrived in an equally harsh but different landscape of the deserts, like in the Kalahari Desert in Africa. You have the San people um, uh, or Bushmen that you know that still live there. But in the Pacific Rim, the area we're focusing on, you have on the polar opposite from the Eskimos, the in Inuit, we have the Aborigines. Uh, the Aborigines live in the uh, in the un unforgiving deserts of Australia. They've been there for about 40 to 50,000 years, right? Now, when Aborigines first arrived to Australia, the land was a little bit more hospitable than it is today, right? But Aborigines live in small kin-related groups, typical of hunter-gatherers, right? Uh, they have many different clans, many different tribal units have been identified. Um, they spoke more than 250 different languages and some 600 dialects, although almost all of these have fallen out of use and have been lost forever, right? The Aborigines use mainly stone, wood, and bone to make essential tools. Um, the uh, Aboriginal's most famous hunting weapon, of course, is the boomerang. Matter of fact, the bow and arrow, which is found in almost every civilization around the world, is not used by the Aborigines except for a small uh, northern region where they obviously had, had contact with islanders and outsiders, right? Uh, Aborigin Aborigines did, though, develop barbed spears and darts, right? Groups living in various parts of Australia conducted a flourishing trade with one another. Items such as shells and quartz and pearls and animal products have been found uh, many hundred miles away from their possible points of origin, right? Religious beliefs emphasize a sense of continuity between the past, the present, and the future. Uh, this perception that spirits had existed from the time of cre creation do exist and continue all the way to the present day, right, in the present world. This notion is embodied by a concept that's really kind of mistakenly translated as dream time or dreaming. Uh, Australian Aboriginal art is particularly well known for its unique inventive, inventive aesthetic, right, such as a technique of forming pictures from colored dots resembling, resembling uh, you know, canvases of 19th century uh, pointillist painters, right? Their art often depicts scenes of everyday life, such as hunting. Um, much of it also serves as a medium of expressing that rich mythology and spirituality and illustrating ceremonies and rituals in their history. Uh, some of these rock engravings date to more than 20,000 years ago, suggesting a long uh, uh, tradition of this, this artistic uh, aesthetic. Finally, we have the nomads of the sea that we collectively call the Polynesians, right? And they're genetically related to the Aborigines of Australia. Uh, they also constitute one of the more remarkable co cultures that perfectly adapted to their specific environment, the Pacific Ocean, Oceania, right? Uh, Oceania uh, consists of innumerable islands forming a great arc that starts in the Philippines and Indonesia and continues past Australia and New, and New Guinea and the New uh, Herbrids and then stretches far out into the Pacific with the Marshall Islands and Fiji and Samoa and the so Society Islands and the Marrakesh, right? The northernmost edge of this region is marked by the Hawaiian Islands, and the southernmost is by New Zealand, and the easternmost, the Easter Island. Between 3000 and 1500 BCE, uh, enterprising seagoing people uh, that anthropologists had labeled um, Austronesians began to spread from Asia through these networks of islands, right? Genetic analysis suggests that their point of origin was probably somewhere near modern Taiwan. Uh, the earliest distinct culture which we have archaeological evidence is a group called the Lapita, which around 1500 had settled in uh, Melanesia. All right, the Lapita culture is best known for its distinctive style of pottery. From Melanesia, the Lapita expanded into Western Polynesia, reaching Fiji and Tonga and Samoa by 900 BCE. Right, uh, the Lapita did not 
uh, uh, practice true farming, but they did create temporary fields using a slash and burn uh, type of agriculture. They also introduced domesticated animals to the islands, including chickens and dogs. Uh, their descendants set further still across uh, Eastern Polynesia and they settled the Cook Islands and Tahiti by 300 BCE, then reached Easter Island and the Hawaiian Islands by 500 CE. Uh, finally, the last of these oceanic explorers settled in New Zealand around the 13th century, establishing uh, the roots of Maori culture, right? These islands were not promising zones for intensive agriculture. The only ed edible indigenous plants were uh, nuts, and most plants now associated with these islands, things like uh, bananas, coconuts, yams, breadfruit, these were all imported. We're not, they were not indigenous uh, to the area. Also, these volcanic islands had very poor soil, and hurricanes would occasionally just deposit salt water across an entire island, effectively spoiling the land, poisoning the soil, right? But luckily, most of these islands were atolls surrounded by extensive reefs that had exceptional rich marine life. So Polynesians became expert fishermen, right? Uh, now, Polynesians themselves do not consist one political or social entity, right? Each island or part of island involves its own distinct and variant core culture. There's more than 1,200 different languages that have been uh, identified in Oceania as well uh, they're, uh, even though they are closely linguistically related to each other, right? A king or chief typically rules over each group, which has a lively trade and interaction with other islands, right? The key to the spread of the course is, for the Polynesians is their ability as sailors and shipbuilders and navigators, right? Without technological aids, these people, these sailors crossed thousands of miles of ocean and found their way to tiny islands. If you miss one of these islands in the Pacific, there's a whole lot of Pacific Ocean, a whole lot of dead, right? So it's something that you definitely want to make sure you get right. So they developed a, a lot of, uh, of, of ways to determine where they were, right? Um, additionally, they also had to contend with the fact that they were expanding eastward in a region where the winds typically move westward. So they're actually struggling against the forces of nature. So the Lapita, for example, they developed a seagoing canoe with outriggers to stabilize them, right? Um, the original ones were simply hollowed out logs propelled with power, uh, paddles with a simple lateen sail that allowed them to attack uh, up against the wind relatively effectively, right? These boats initially, though, weren't large enough to carry on large voyages to far islands, but they eventually developed even more uh, um, intricate uh, uh, boats, some of them extending beyond 100 feet in length that could carry a substantial crew and cargo for thousand, uh, journeys thousands of miles long. Uh, navigation, they, they developed techniques of lab navigation through a combination of trial and error and oral transmission, right? Accumulating knowledge. They learned how to use the stars and birds and clouds and currents and, and even the waves to guide them. You could identify where land was by um, changes in the ocean swells or variations in the wind or the currents, right? Or just the presence of land birds flying overhead, right? Sometimes you could even see uh, uh, land over the horizon just by seeing the reflection on the undersides of clouds, right? So the Polynesians don't develop any massive cities, but they did develop a very successful, rich, and very long-lasting culture uh, and in the areas of seafaring and navigation, their achievements are some of the most impressive uh, uh, achievements by any civilization in history.